it's uh, three o'clock, so I don't know <coughs> if I need anybody's starter's pistol to get me going or whether I can just go. <laughs> Thank you. Well, today I'm talking about the Southern African frontier, the Cape frontier, the frontier of the Cape Colony, which is a very different in scale and nature to what we were talking about yesterday. Yesterday, talking about the uh, French Revolutionary Wars and the Napoleonic Wars and massacre on the frontiers of French imperial expansion, we were dealing with huge numbers and uh, vast territories and uh, huge numbers of casualties. The South African case, or the Southern African case, um, requires you to make a sort of a change of scale. I mean, demographics is, is a very important thing to think about here. The sheer numbers of people we're dealing with in Southern Africa are a lot smaller than they were in Europe. And even when we go on to looking at North America, you'll see numbers of, of people in Southern Africa pale into insignificance compared to the millions of people involved in North America. And perhaps Australia, uh, the numbers of people are comparatively are relatively thin on the ground as well. But here, nobody has ever really given a satisfactory estimate of the numbers of indigenous people in Southern Africa before Europeans arrive. Uh, figures for the Khoisan, some people have suggested uh, 200,000, 300,000. This is sort of guesswork. We don't really know. And we, and of course, we're not dealing with fixed, stable political borders in, in this period, in this country. People are highly mobile, semi-nomadic. And the entire environment of Southern Africa, well, two-thirds of it is too arid for agriculture and only just able to cope with pastoralism. So it's a very arid environment which favored the hunter-gatherer lifestyle of the great majority of the indigenous people. And when Europeans did begin to settle and expand from, from their center at Cape Town, the numbers we're dealing with were, were terribly small as well. I've always been struck by the figure that around about the time when the British arrived at the Cape 1795, the entire free population of the Cape was numbered at about 20,000, which is less than the population of UCT. So you're dealing with a very small white settler community here. And at the same time, in, the United, in America, you had millions of white settlers. So the chances are that if you were a white settler in early South Africa, uh, you would probably know or be related to quite a number of, of the people that you came in contact with in, in your daily life. And similarly, on the frontier zones itself, itself I'd like to stress here a degree of int intimacy about frontier relations on the southern African frontier. Because population groups were small, because distances were vast, uh, there was a great deal of intermingling, intermixing between the different population groups in the frontier zone. So the chances are that in a frontier situation, you're not dealing with complete strangers. I mean, after all, most people's response in meeting a complete stranger is not straight away to kill them. Uh, violence is not the default mode of an encounter in the frontier zone. When you are fragile, isolated, lonely, culturally insecure, your first instinct is to try and forge some sort of relationship of understanding, sympathy, th through friendship and trade. And we must imagine this happening on the South African frontier. Later on, of course, relationships can sour. You can begin to mistrust people, accuse them of theft, adultery, whatever it is. Later on, you know, intimacy can lead to violence, but initially, um, these are a couple of themes I'd like you to think about. A sparse population, vast distances, a harsh environment, a need to forge relationships of friendship initially in frontier situations, uh, 
these are the characteristics of the frontier zone. How does the Cape really fit into the revolutionary period? Just a few introductory remarks before getting to the meat of things. Well, the Cape frontier, the Cape is a very complicated place. Um, for a start, you had not just one uh, European colonial empire making its presence felt here. You had two. Firstly, the Dutch, and I think we can call the Dutch East Indies Company uh, a, an empire, even though it was a company. It was a, a strange hybrid form, a company empire, which, after all, is what rules most of the world today, company empires. So you had a Dutch company empire, and then you had a British imperial colonial project. All this was superimposed on a society which had a very diverse population. You had hunter-gatherers, you had pastoralists, and you had agro-pastoralists, San, Khoi Khoi, and Kosa. So you have two colonizing powers, three sets of indigenous people, defined here by their economic lifestyle, rather than cultural language or, or anything else. And you also have, just in the Cape alone, uh, at least two distinct frontier zones. Um, I'm using a, 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 an old-fashioned terminology here. Some people no longer like to think in terms of frontier zones. They prefer to think of other paradigms to explain the encounter to conceptualize the encounter by two or more distinct societies uh, with different socioeconomic lifestyles predicated upon different modes of production, to use a Marxist term. Uh, all of these I think of as being components of what we call the frontier zone, but some people prefer to use the concept of the middle ground uh, as a meeting place of different cultures. But I'm sticking to the frontier zone concept and we have at least two in the Cape. There's the Northern Frontier Zone, which I have referred to in, in a book which I see happily is still for sale at Clark's outside for a vast amount of money, imported especially from America for the occasion. The Forgotten Frontier celebrates the fact that the Northern Frontier of the Cape was one of the Cape Frontiers and is the forgotten one. And this is largely the frontier between Dutch settler colonists and the Khoisan of the Cape. The second frontier, and for many South Africans and historians, the more important frontier is the Eastern Cape frontier, the frontier between white settler colonists and the Ikosa. And this is a frontier that uh, was the site of at least a uh, hundred years of continuous or almost continuous warfare. Christopher Saunders, the distinguished South African historian, I think was the first to call this the Hundred Years' War of South African history. And for many historians, this eastern frontier was where it all happened, the crucible of South African history. If you read Noel Mostert's book, Frontiers, uh, it's subtitled The Epic of South African History and the Tragedy of the Kosa People. It is an epic, it's over 1,500 pages. Um, <laughs> So, but all of them highly readable, so I would recommend that book. But anyway, for many historians and South Africans, the Eastern Frontier is the epic crucible of where things, uh, where, where, the, where the birth of a nation or the death of a nation took place and not the Northern Frontier. So in this lecture, I have set myself a vast task. It's to discuss uh, two different imperial powers three different in, uh, indigenous people, and two distinct frontier zones, all within uh, this period. So, so wish me luck, and uh, if, if nothing, uh, if, if, uh, if, uh, if there's some gaps in my narrative, uh, do let me know and ask questions. Let me uh, just begin. This is, everybody probably knows about the country they, they live in but basically the arid part of it was occupied by people we call Khoisan, who are the uh, people of, of uh, who are the indigenous people of the country. Uh, many of them were hunter-gatherers. At some stage, around about 2,000 years before present, some of these hunter-gatherers 
and became pastoralist. Let's not go into details as how this happened. That would take another 16 lectures. Uh, how did some hunter-gatherers become the pastoralists, and how distinct were these pastoralists from the hunter-gatherers? Are questions we can't go, go into at the moment. But anyway, the convention is that we call these indigenous pastoralists the Khoi, and we call the indigenous hunter-gatherers the San, and together they are the Khoi San. Around about 2,000 years before present, um, Bantu-speaking Iron Age agro-pastoralists came into this part of the world, and they crossed the sort of Limpopo River about the year Dot, uh, stuck largely to the low felt and the eastern escarpment, and uh, were found probably in parts of the Trans Sky um, and the Eastern Cape as early as maybe the seventh century. Archaeologists are fighting about these dates. But the point about these agro pastoralist Bantu speaking Iron Age type of people is that they grew crops, and for their crops they needed summer rainfall, and the limits of their expansion were largely determined by summer rainfall conditions. The 400 millimeter isohyte is crucial here. You can't really grow summer rainfall crops westward of that uh, summer rainfall isohyte, and it's round about the Kaiskana Kai River at a push some good years the Sundays River. Um, you can graze cattle as far as the, in, in the, the, around Port Elizabeth, but you can't always successfully grow summer rainfall crops. And this really determined, I suppose, the uh, positioning of the indigenous people of Southern Africa uh, before Europeans arrived here. Just a few words to say about the Khoisan. You all know, you're all um, familiar with the the lifestyle and the legends that go uh, with the um, with the San. Um, just to make a few points to link this to the revolutionary period, we are sort of one of the questions we're asking is how did Europeans perceive indigenous people? Did this affect the ways that they interacted with them? Did this affect their propensity to massacre these people? In other words. Um, did they look at people like this and think of them as subhuman inferiors? Was there a type of racism which is, is going to manifest itself on the frontiers? And I think most historians agree that in the 18th century, which is roughly the period we're looking at, the revolutionary period, racism is a premature idea. The scientific racism is more of a 19th century idea inspired uh, partly by the ideas of Darwin, but also by some of the ideas of um, the botany and Linnaeus's classification of plants. The, the scientific classification of humans gets going a bit later in the 18th century, and with it, racism. In the mid-18th century, the period of the Enlightenment, sort of philosophers and thinkers who affected the conception of uh, the actors in the revolutionary period, the idea was more that you are either civilized or savage. The world was divided not into different races so much, but those people who were savage and civilized. And to be savage in enlightenment terms is not necessarily always a bad thing. The noble savage, the idea of the noble savage, which we associate with Rousseau, uh, but we could also associate with people like Diderot. And um, by the way, Diderot got many of his shaping ideas from the commander of the Cape Garrison, Robert Jacob Gordon, who traveled extensively amongst the Khoisan, wrote letters to Diderot and told Diderot that the Khoi are wonderful people, they live in harmony with nature, they're gentle, they're intelligent. And the picture of the noble savage then could have been one of the ideas associated with uh, the San and the Khoi. But this was but one of uh, two different discourses which uh, were in inspiring the thinkers of the, of the in Enlightenment. The other idea, of course, was the idea of the ignoble savage, that certain people are barbaric, underdeveloped, primitive, uh, not civilized at all, and these people might perhaps be uh, worthy of our sympathy and capable of education, but um, they are a block, in a way, 
to modernity and progress. And if savage and primitive people uh, fall by the wayside, then perhaps one shouldn't worry too much about it. The, this is sort of these rival conflicting ideas which are going through the minds of educated Europeans, perhaps, and perhaps filtering down to the minds of uneducated or poorly educated Europeans. Um, so one further idea about Enlightenment thinking, which I, I need to make either here or in the following lectures, is that in Scotland during the Enlightenment, there were a number of thinkers, uh, Hume is one of them, that uh, we associate with a movement called the Scottish Enlightenment. And some of these figures were actually historians, and they attempted to classify mankind into different stages of development. The, the first stage of mankind were, was the hunter-gatherer stage. This was the most primitive stage. Secondly came the pastoralist stage, where people kept livestock. Uh, thirdly was the agriculturalist stage, and fourthly, was basically the stage which had been reached by the Enlightenment thinkers in Scotland. Um, it was the stage of commerce, of industry, of capitalism, uh, of trade, and um, sort of urban dwelling. So these four stages of man is an idea that was very prevalent throughout the Enlightenment world. And in South Africa, those people who came to South Africa had the opportunity of seeing all four stages of man as it were together. And naturally, their thinking became somewhat hierarchical. They believed there was an order of excellence that the, the worst, as it were, uh, stage to be at was hunter-gathering, and the best was to be um, a commercial type of trader who, who, who masters agriculture, pastoralism, and hunting. So this is uh, part of the background to the story I need to tell. The other part of the story is that there are two sides to the frontier. We should always, although I don't manage to give equal emphasis to this in, in, in these lectures, always try and think about how the indigenous, um, indigenous people are viewing Europeans and, and how they see them. And uh, trying to, I suppose, it, it acknowledge that, that a front, in the frontier is not just one-way traffic, it's two-way traffic. So I'm just um, the San who are going to be the victims largely of the ex extermination and colonial expansion of especially the Dutch colonial frontier. We're busy uh, trying to understand uh, these people, putting them into their world pictures into their world systems. Uh, women were typically represented wearing uh, skirts and bonnets, and white settlers are very often shown with their hands on the hips. Throughout the world, colonialists are shown in a teapot position, which uh, apparently in Amsterdam that means sexual availability, but in the rest of the world it means I'm an idle overseer and I don't do any work. Um, and colonists uh, are always portrayed like that. Um, so let's, the, here, um, if, if the sand then were at the bottom of the scale of, um, as it were, enlightenment intellectual perception, possibly uh, recipients of benevolent goodwill in, if they manifest themselves as noble savage, then the koi were the second Stage and these are, re are uniquely sympathetic depictions of the Koi Koi by an anonymous Dutch artist of the Cape around about 1700. Um, he's depicting the Koi Koi here uh, at the moment when they are involved in interaction with the colonists. You can see that they are these women here are smoking tobacco. They are drinking alcohol. Um, yet they still have their cattle and sheep, they're still dressed in koi garments, they're still attired with koi embroidery. All of this ends around about 1713 when smallpox visits the Cape, uh, coming from the infected laundry of a passing European ship, and this way of life is smashed and, and shattered, and the koi koi 
are now uh, in the urban peripheries of Cape Town, uh, much more, uh, they've lost their traditional way of life, and they have now become either workers on colonial farms, or they've retreated into the interior where they're trying to resist the uh, encroachment of the Europeans. And these are illustrations from a book which was written or composed around about this time. It's from Kolb's, uh, Kolb's description of the Cape. Uh, Kolb was at the Cape in around 1705. The book was published 1719. Here we're still seeing the Koi being depicted, I suppose, as though they are um, people of the culture. These are burial ceremonies, people of interest, uh, people worth studying, people who are you know, part of, I suppose, the of the Enlightenment project of gathering knowledge about humanity. The Koi are, are worthy people to occupy a chapter of this book. This, of course, begins to change as the Dutch colony at the Cape expands. And it really got going, particularly in the 18th century, particularly after the smallpox epidemic had thinned the ranks of the Khoi and made expansion into the Cape interior more easy. The Cape interior, as I've already suggested to you, two thirds of it is extremely arid. And the only practical lifestyle that was available to people of Dutch or German descent who were trying to carve out a niche for themselves, any practical occupation was to become a pastoralist farmer. And this they learnt, they learnt how to become pastoralists in the South African interior from the Khoi Khoi, from the very people whose land they were taking, whose cattle they were appropriating, and whose labour they were using for themselves. So the Khoi Khoi are absorbed into the, we call these and these pastoralist farmers, trek boers. The Khoi Khoi are absorbed into the trek boer economy uh, from 1700 onward. And as the colony expands, so Khoi Khoi and also sand resistance intensifies. Um, some words about this resistance. I think you, as South Africans, you all know that probably uh, the major agent of the conquest of the Khoisan was something we call commandos, the commando system. Commandos were basically armed and mounted men on horses. They were uh, about 50% European and 50% or more consisted of the servants, the Handlangers or the descendants of the Europeans. These might be Khoi servants, they might be people of mixed race called busters in the 18th century, or busted Hottentots. And commandos were frequently manned by both busted Hottentots, busters, and Europeans. And this is one of the features of the South African frontier, at any rate, is the mixed racial composition of the frontier societies. It would be wrong to think of this as a pure white versus black type of uh, frontier. This is a frontier of complexity, of integration, of intimacy. People change sides, and one day you might be fighting on the side of the commando, and the next day the commando might be pursuing you. Um, this is part of the danger of, of this way of life. Anyway, commandos typically went after people they called Bushmen, who we would probably call Sam, but we must acknowledge that amongst the ranks of the Bushmen or Sam were also Khoi Khoi resistors. Typically, the, uh, some very, very heavy fighting, the, the heaviest fighting began along the Rockefelt and Nivefelt escarpments, which the Trek Boers entered from 1740 onwards. And in, this is an arid region, and in order to survive in this arid region, the Trek Boers, like the Khoi, like the sand before them, had to trek into the winter, into the summer rainfall areas in the summer, and the winter rainfall areas in the winter. So basing themselves in the escarpment where there's good perennial water, relatively good perennial water, relatively good grazing, they would move northwards in the summer and southwestwards in the winter. Uh, these movements were mimicking the movement of the movement of game, mimicking 
the, the movement of, I suppose, the rains uh, following these. And, and of course, this movement had dire consequences for the San and the Khoi, whose herds and whose hunting sources followed the same movement. So intense fighting breaks out in the 1750s, 1760s. By 1772, you have something called the General Commando, which basically mobilizes based virtually every single frontier farmer in the colony and mounts a three-pointed attack on Khoisan resistors from the Snewberg here to the Niverfelt here and the Rockefeller here. Hundreds of Khoisan are killed in the course of these engagements. Most of these engagements take the form of a commander going out and identifying where some San or Khoi San might be. And then lying low during the night and at dawn encircling the camp and attacking them. This is very, very characteristic, not just of the South African frontier, but of the Australian frontier as well, and indeed the American frontier. Colonists had the advantage of horses and firearms, so it was perhaps easier for them to move faster, use encircling tactics, and of course they had scouts who were drawn from the ranks of Koi and San themselves. The San often gave themselves away by lighting fires, um, so winter was a good time to, to um, go on commando, because the sand gave themselves in fires. Uh, spring wasn't such a good time, uh, because uh, your, your gunpowder would get damp in rain. But anyway, incremental, continuous commando attacks, which reached a peak in the 1770s, but continued uh, right up until the arrival of the British in the 1790s. People would obviously want to try and quantify the numbers of sand killed. We simply don't know. All I can do is, is give you um, uh, the, the Dutch colonists, unlike the Australian and the English-speaking colonists in North America, were largely illiterate. They didn't leave good records behind them. Their leaders um, do not very often wax poetic. Uh, there are very few personal accounts or diaries or letters. So in other words, the archival record is sparse to try and trace the amount of damage done to the sand. Nonetheless, we do have clues and um, the, the, the casualty figure is probably in uh, the tens of thousands. Even though the average engagement of the commander encountering a group of sand. Uh, numbers are usually quite low, the, the sand casualties are quite low, although there are occasions when two to three hundred sand at a time are described as being killed. Now these are obviously massacres. When you have two to three hundred people being killed in one incident and one or two colonists wounded, that is a massacre. So how do massacres take place? As I say, encirclement, the men get their their muskets or their firearms, they form a ring around the sleeping men, women, and children. At a signal, then they start firing on the sleeping uh, sand and take no survivors. Or if they do take survivors, they take women and children, they kill the men. And this begins a custom of taking Bushmen or sand children as captives. We see this happening on the Australian frontier as well. The absorption of children into the labor force of the Trek Boer economy. And this rather goes against some of the definitions of genocide. If genocide is the attempt to deliberately exterminate the entire population of a group simply because of their race, well, the San did not perhaps suffer genocide. They suffered the genocide of their culture and their way of life. Uh, along with hunter-gatherers all over the world. But the genetic material of the sand is still very much present in the farm-working population of the Cape interior. Um, and there's some interesting stories, which if I had time, 
and it could go into to suggest the survival of the sound and even the survival of some of the culture and stories amongst farm workers of the Cape. But anyway, this is of little consolation to the sound as a whole, who were being exterminated by Dutch commandos right up until 1795 when the British arrived. Why were these commandos massacring the sound? Partly it was because they viewed them as being surplus to the requirements of the pastoralist economy. Basically, Khoi Khoi worked as pastoral laborers for the Dutch. Sam didn't so much do so. It's not to say Sam couldn't work for the Dutch farmers, because I've just told you that women and children did. It's because in the perception of the Dutch, hunter-gatherers were useless. They were not pastoral laborers. They were just vermin. They referred to the, the sand as skepsels uh, most of the time. They were vermin to be exterminated. And we have several uh, um, statements by, by Boer frontier farmers that to kill a Hottentot is nothing, or to kill a Bushman is nothing. It's like, to me, it's like plucking a leaf off a tree, uh, this disdain for, for their life. However, <clears throat> um, things changed to some extent with the arrival of the British, which happened in 1795. And here, once again, we should be reminded of global forces, revolutionary um, currents, which are affecting even the Cape. The British come to the Cape because of the French Revolutionary Wars. The French forces have overrun the Netherlands. They've chased out the Dutch monarchy. And the Dutch monarchy goes to Britain and says, please, can you defend the Cape, take over the Cape in the name of the House of Orange, and prevent it from falling into the hands of the French? The British are only too happy to oblige. Um, they have reasons of their own, of course, for wanting to capture the Cape. And one of that, one of those reasons is the second British Empire, which is now focusing on the Indian Ocean, the Pacific, Australia, and India. And the Cape is seen as being an absolutely vital naval base for this new second British uh, Empire. Um, the Cape is seen as being the Gibraltar of the South in, in some of the writing of, of the British. And when the British take over the Cape, as I say, they are not taking over, as it were, British subjects or British settlers who they might have treated differently. They are taking over Dutch subjects, Dutch settlers. And there was a degree of prejudice uh, amongst the British against the Dutch. Um, they, the British uh, saw the Dutch as being um, not quite up to the mark in terms of setting an example of European colonization. They thought the Dutch were lazy, indolent, idle, addicted to slavery. And, and actually, one of the things the British didn't approve of, this might surprise you, was the Dutch custom of sending out commandos to exterminate the Sam. Despite what British subjects and people of British descent are going to be doing in Australia and in North America, the British government at the Cape does not approve of the Dutch policy towards the Sam. And 1795, the arrival of the British at the Cape coincides with heightened interest in the abolition of the slave trade, in, in England. Uh, humanitarianism is on the rise in England. This is part of the offspin of revolutionary idealism, I suppose, that even the British uh, are interested in uh, humanitarianism. Also, the England is full of missionaries itching to convert the savages and barbarians to Christianity. And the British government allows missionaries into the Cape whereas the policy of the Dutch government had been to prohibit uh, missionary activity. So the British arrival at the Cape marks a change in attitude towards the extermination of the Sam. And an important, uh, so this is an important moment. The British take stock of, of the Cape. They want to put a stop to border, to border insecurity. They want to keep the Boers under control. 
Uh, the Boers must be taught that they are a subject nation, uh, subject to a stern but humanitarian British government. So they can't just continue to do what they like. Um, and the British also are enthused with some of the ideas. This is, we're talking about the first British occupation year, 1795 to 1803. They're enthused with ideas of romanticism and ideas of the noble savage. And this is perhaps well expressed in the artworks of Samuel Daniel, a British artist who came to the Cape at this time, and his very sympathetic portraits of indigenous people, which show them of beautiful stature, uh, elegant, lively, uh, completely healthy. The landscape is you know, gloriously romantic, of course, as it is in the Cape. Uh, that is seen through the ideas of a particular vision of society. And people like Daniel actually sympathized with the sound, um, deplored the fact that they were being massacred, and idealized the Cosa, who they thought were the most perfect specimens of humanity they'd ever seen, their diet, their way of life, their way of warfare, way of making love, everything about them was absolutely perfect. And this is captured in writing. Uh, the, the, the art is perhaps uh, captured by Samuel Daniel, but the, this vision is captured in writing by John Barrow, who was the colonial secretary of the Cape um, and the private secretary of uh, Earl McCartney, one of the, the first governors of the Cape in the first British occupation. And Barrow traveled extensively through the Cape eventually penned this map of the Cape, which uh, generations after Barrow, people were complaining about how inaccurate it was. I think Colonel Graham, who was trying to conduct military operations in Grahamstown, said, according to Barrow's map, I would now be 300 kilometers into the sea. Um, so Barrow wasn't a, perhaps a perfect specimen of humanity, but you must imagine Try it, try it for yourself. You go off into the Cape interior with an ox wagon and a length of chain and see how good a map you managed to, to make. In the course of Barrow's travels, he was asked to inspect the frontiers, to see how peace could be made with uh, the, the Sam, and to try and put an end to the fighting with the Cosa, about whom I must uh, rapidly begin to say something. But in Barrow's map of the Cape and uh, Barrow's description of the Cape in a massive work he wrote called Travels in the Interior of South Africa, he had a description where he describes the attack of a commando on a group of sand. And Barrow is appalled. He's a sort of a tourist on a commando, I suppose it's like, you know, he goes along to see what is actually happening on the frontier and what he sees are the Boers shooting at random, killing women and children for no good reason. And Barrow sends a report to, to McCartney and says, you know, the Boers are responsible for this. Well, the San are innocent people. Uh, let's try and make peace. And the British idea of peace is to get the frontier farmers with the assistance of missionaries to give gifts of sheep to the frontier San and to establish mission stations amongst the sun. And this policy actually works. So successful is it that fighting stops uh, for a while. Um, the sun accept gifts of peace, accept sheep, accept tobacco. But under the guise of peace, the Trek Boers now infiltrate the land which previously had been closed to them. They take over the water holes, they shoot, out the eland herds. They cover the countryside um, under the guise of peace, which they haven't been able to accomplish under the guise of war. So this uh, was bad news for the San. Let's leave the San there roughly at about 1803, um, the end of the first British occupation. The British come back in 186. And when they come back now, their main priority is to deal with the eastern frontier. So let me try and say something about Cosa and the eastern frontier. Now I've explained to you that the British were not all that sympathetic to the project of exterminating the sand. What was happening 
on the eastern frontier? Well, you had three frontier wars uh, before 18, uh, before 1799. These frontier wars were largely between Boers and Kosa, but there were also groups of Khoi descent mixed up amongst the Kosa, and indeed in the region in front of the Kosa, which nowadays we would call the Sirfelt or Saarfelt, um, which I suppose is known to, to many of you. This is a true frontier region. It was a true frontier region, the Sirfelt. It was a region in which no one political group could claim supremacy. And why no one political group could claim supremacy was because it was this intersection of different ways of life. It was an intersection of Khoi pastoralism, an intersection of Khoza agriculture, an intersection of Trek Boer pastoralism, an intersection of sand hunting and gathering. With all these different communities contending for supremacy in the region, no one group uh, could prevail. And the first two frontier wars, the first and second, are basically, you might say, between Boer pastoralists, Trek Boers, and the Khoi and Koza pastoralists, who all want to graze their cattle in this region. Why why nobody can prevail. Remember the small numbers of Boers that, that I'm talking about here? The, the Boers are simply not powerful enough to expel the Khoza. What they would like to do, let's see if I can find a clearer map. Um, it's not very really clear, but what, what they would like to do um, is expel the Khoza out of the Sirfeld. The Boers would like to expel them from the region. The Khoza claim that this region is theirs, although perhaps rightly it should have belonged to the Khoi. The Khoi probably were the first possessors, first pastoral possessions, possessors of this region. We know this from linguistic evidence, the clicks in the Khoza language, the place names of of rivers and mountain features. We also know this from oral tradition, that there are various Khoi chieftains who had a, a long history in this region. To complicate matters, there were groups that were mixed between Khoi and Khoza, like the Gunakwebe. Please excuse my clicks, that they are not at all accurate. They are more impressionistic to, and I'm not a Khoza speaker, but um, I am trying. Um, so these mixed groups of Gona Kwebe, um, of Khoi descent, no one group is um, uh, uh, dominant in the region. And when the Boers try to push out uh, the Khoza in and, and gain supremacy over the local Khoi, they simply fail. And this is the situation that exists when the British uh, come to the Cape in 1795 and they investigate what's happening on the frontier, and they try and prevent further uh, war from taking place. In the event, by sending troops to the frontier, the British created an impression amongst the Khoi that the British were coming to help the Khoi, so the Khoi rose up in rebellion against the Boers, and they were promptly joined by the Khoza, and so the British presence really sparked off the third frontier war, so it wasn't a pacifying mission at all in, in the end. And, what, and Barrow was once again an observer of these events, and what he decided was that it was impossible given the current state of military strength of the colonists and of the British to actually drive that closer out of this region. We'd just have to wait. And so rushing, fast forwarding my narrative, to um, about 1806, when the British returned from the second British occupation, it is now a very different regime to the regime of the first British occupation. It is different because it has been hardened and forged in the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. The 
the second British occupation is an occupation in which the military that arrives at the Cape to, uh, to reassess frontier security has had experience in the Peninsular Wars. Many of the military leaders, many of the governors of the Cape now have had experience in these wars. And they are a much harder, less sympathetic, less, sympathetic, less humanitarian force than they were the first time around. Um, basically, the British decide that the only way peace is going to be maintained on the frontier is to push the Kosa beyond uh, the Fish River. The idea that the Fish River was the boundary of the colony dates back to the 1770s, where Governor van Plettenberg tried to make an arrangement with certain Kosa chiefs that it should indeed be the boundary. The trouble was that not all the chiefs he spoke to had authority to make this, this deal. The trouble is also that the river meanders. Uh, the trouble is also the river is very thick with bush and is easily fordable at certain times of year. It's not really a very good frontier at all. And of course, the Kosa had no real, nobody had any real interest in keeping a fixed frontier. So it was difficult to enforce. Nobody actually tried to do it until the British decided they had uh, marshaled enough force to do so. When they eventually uh, moved to expel the Kosa from the Sea of Felt, it was under, uh, uh, you can read the nice account about this, is in Ben McClellan's book, A Proper Degree of Terror, and Earl Mustard also deals with this. I'm simplifying the tale a lot. But basically, once the British decided to use military force to expel the Kosa, so there's a new, as it were, climate arrived on the frontier. This, this is the beginning, I suppose, of the possibility of inflicting massacre upon the Kosa people. Before them, this ability didn't exist. The settlers were simply too weak. They're not saying that massacres hadn't occurred before. A particularly nasty frontier uh, farmer called Adrian van Jarsfeld was famous for perpetrating not one but two different massacres. He used the same tricks on um, both times. The first was a massacre against the San back in the 1770s when he traveled up the, uh, uh, what is the river I'm thinking of? Uh, the name escapes me temporarily, up to, uh, just on the banks of the Orange River. He shot a whole lot of hippopotami, laid the carcasses temptingly out, and then retreated. The Sam came to feast on the carcasses, and the next day, uh, Van Jarstorff massacred the Sam, who had thought that they were receiving a gift, but were being trapped. In the Second Frontier War as well, Van Jarstorff used a similar tactic to massacre a group of Kosa. He scattered tobacco on the ground in front of them, and as they dropped their assegais and rushed to get the tobacco, he and his men shot them. These incidents were not forgotten, and they would provoke counter massacres in the future. But this was the sort of frontier massacre I'm talking about. It was trickery, duplicity, on the part of people who knew very often the people that they were uh, interacting with. Back in 1738, a man called Kibalas up the west coast massacred a group of Khoisan using similar tactics. He knew the people. They were farm workers who had gone into a rebellion, uh, Khoisan farm workers. He and his men moved amongst them, chatting, distributing gifts, and suddenly, at a signal, to use the uh, term made famous by Premier, Premier League football, you get your retaliation in first. There were little massacres like this where you got your retaliation in first, killing people you thought might be a threat. But in the large scale of things, these weren't as important as what happened following um, the clearing of the Seerfeld in 18, between 1809 and 1812 where British forces, backed up by commandos, 
by local militia auxiliaries, you might say, backed up by the Cape Corps, a, a unit made out of uh, Khoisan or colored troops. These, this military force was now strong enough to implement tactics it had learned in the Spanish Peninsula. One of these tactics was basically to drive in a line, to almost like a game shoot, to, to make your troops dense enough to move through thick bush, killing every single person you found in your path, man, woman, and child. Once you had accomplished this, and by the way, if you've ever been to the Addo Elephant Park, the Addo Bush was a place where this sort of technique was used to clear the cause out of the Addo Bush. Once you've accomplished this, the other technique that was used that had been employed in the Peninsula War was that of scorched earth. You destroyed every single crop, building, village, hut, uh, confiscated all livestock, squashed every pumpkin you could find uh, to eradicate the presence of the Cosa in the Sea of Feld. So this was a, a new style of warfare. A new style of warfare, the expulsion of the Cosa from the Sea of Feld, implemented by the British. Was, did this involve massacre? The answer is yes, it did. Although, once again, it is hard to document this because evidence is retrospective and fleeting. One of Thomas Pringle's informants, a Scottish uh, military man, wrote, wrote him an account. Uh, Pringle publicized this, but the original has been lost. But basically, the imperative of the military was, and they had orders to this effect from Craddock, Governor Craddock was a particularly nasty person, hardened in the Peninsula Wars, in putting down the Irish Rebellion, putting down mutinies in India. He was a typical product of the Second British Empire. Craddock gave orders to his troops not to take prisoners if they were to become an encumbrance. All right, he couched his orders be as precatory as you can to begin with, but in the event that you then meet resistance, take any measures you might see fit to deal, uh, to get, encourage these people to vacate the land. And these measures were taken, they're particularly taken by Colonel Graham, after whom Graham's town was named, or used to be named. Um, and Colonel Graham is the man who basically writes a letter afterwards saying, he executed this whole task uh, without using more than a proper degree of terror, which is what Ben McClellan uh, celebrates in, in his book. And of course, we see this word, this use of terror having been used during the uh, in Revolution in France, during the wars of the Napoleonic Wars, and by British forces in Spain. And now they are using them perhaps uh, for the first time as a deliberate policy uh, in the Eastern Cape. And this policy can only be referred to as ethnic cleansing. You are removing an entire <coughs> ethnic, cultural, linguistic group from a piece of territory and forcing them off it uh, by taking no prisoners. We also have another account of what was happening by Andre Stockenstrom, who later becomes Lieutenant General of the Eastern Cape, or Lieutenant Governor, sorry, of the Eastern Cape. Stockenstrom, as a young man, was involved in this type of fighting. Stockenstrom's father actually died in the massacre perpetrated by the Cosa, a 